Okay, um, so yeah, this is uh, Good Fences Make Good Neighbours. Uh, I am Nick Young. I uh, just wanted to, uh, I'm not going to be doing much walking around because of this thing, um, but uh, yeah, let's get started. So, uh, my name is Nick Young. Uh, I am a uh, senior systems engineer with uh, Isovalent. Uh, I do a lot of work on um, Cilium Service Mesh there, but my other hat is that I'm a maintainer on the Gateway API, and that's where that's where all of this work on reference grant uh, mainly comes from. So, uh, as an Australian, I feel like it's uh, quite important that I mention that uh, I'm not talking about this type of neighbours. Um, you know, although uh, the theme song tells us that uh, you know this this type of neighbours often become good friends, um, the uh, the TV show is not what I'm talking about today. What I am talking about is that you know the idea for this talk sort of came from this statement um, that you know it's a bit of a cliche, but you know, good fences make good neighbours is all about the fact that you, if you're living right next to somebody, the thing you need to, the, the thing you need to do is talk to them about, you, know, you need to have agreements about what happens between the two of you, right? Like it's all about agreements and having clear delineation between, between neighbours is what makes neighbours good friends, right? Like that's what the, and so that's, that's sort of the, the, where the theme of the talk came from. So here's what we'll talk about today. So. Namespace is one of the most secu important security boundaries in Kubernetes. Uh, making references across namespaces is actually really easy to get wrong, um, very easy to do in a, in a not great way. Um, there is a little bit of prior art here before reference grant, and then this is how we do it in Gateway API, including reference grant, and what is a reference grant. Um, and then actually there's been a lot of developments in next steps for reference grant. I had to literally update this like three times this week um, because there's been some stuff happened this week. So, uh, I'll get to that at the end. So, Kubernetes namespaces. Um, you know, hopefully, you're all reasonably familiar with uh, Kubernetes, uh, and uh, you know, namespaces are the main way you enclose a trust domain in Kubernetes. Um, most users have access to a bunch of resources in a whole namespace. Um, it's pretty unusual to have people share a namespace and not sort of have access to all the same things. Um, so, generally, in this sort of use case, we've assumed in general that Basically, that people pretty much have like admin over their namespace, right? That they can read, uh, read, write, and patch uh, all uh, resources in their namespace. Generally, um, obviously, that's not always the case, but like most of the design that we're doing here assumes that. Um, it is sometimes really handy to have cross namespace references. Um, you know, a good example here is a uh, you know TLS secrets that you might want uh, some config to be able to consume, but you don't want people to actually be able to read. So an example of that would be. You know, you've got some TLS secret that is the, um, you know, that's the, the key pair for your, the wildcard key pair for your company domain. You don't want everybody to be able to read that key pair, um, but you probably do want a lot of people to be able to use things to make arbitrary, you know, subdomains for ingress or something like that. And so, like, that is a really good use case where it's really good to be able to have, to be able to say, you can use this, but you can't read it. Um, and, you know, another one is that, this is another ingress example. Some people want to have ingress config live in one namespace and the back end's in another. Um, you know, with, with V1 ingress, uh, one of the problems with it is that you can do that really easily, um, you know, but it's kind of not ideal um, because of some of the reasons I'll go into. But yeah, so cross namespace references are actually really hard because it's really easy to accidentally grant too much access. Um, you know, so if you think about it, you know, if uh, you know, Alice owns a namespace and Bob owns a namespace and Alice wants to use something in Bob's namespace and the, the primitives you're using just say, okay, Alice gets to use anything that's in Bob's namespace. Bob has no control, Bob doesn't understand what's being used and has no way to say you can't use this. Maybe Bob has something he doesn't want other people using. But there's no way unless you, unless you do something like this to make sure that you do that. And so that's, that's where we come to the key. The key is that two people need to agree. The person who is making the reference Needs, you know, needs to be able to signal their intent that they want to use a, a, a reference across namespaces, and the person who owns the thing that is being referred, the referent, um, need to be able to, needs to be able to say, this type of, re of reference is okay. Uh, and, you know, so that's, that's the sort of the key. There needs to be a two-way handshake uh, for, the, for namespace, for cross namespace references to be more secure. I won't say secure, because we're at a security conference, we all know there's no such thing as secure, but more secure, I think, is probably the best we can aim for here. I, I should note that uh, I kind of feel like this is a pretty good general security design principle that if you're talking about 
any sort of crossing trust domain relationship, both sides of the trust, you know, of any trust relationship need to agree. Seems pretty stupid and simple when you say it <laughs> aside, but we all know common sense is not that common, right? So, oh, great, my slides have not helped. Thank you for changing my things. Okay, so here's a piece of prior art. Um, well, I mean, for full disclosure, uh, I was a maintainer on Contour. I didn't build this, but I certainly used it a lot. And so um, we had uh, we had we needed to solve that exact problem I talked about before with having you know ingress config live in one uh, namespace and the uh, you know TLS certificate live in another namespace. And so we came up with this um, resource called TLS certificate delegation. And so the way it worked was it lived in alongside the secret that you want to share access to, and basically said for this secret. You know, this, this secret is available to be used by anything in the following, the following namespaces. Uh, notably, you could have star, which means all namespaces. So it's up to the, it's up to the owner to, you know, it is an option for the owner to be super insecure, but they need to actively opt into it. Um, yeah, so, th so this then allowed you to use it in uh, our custom resource HTTP proxy. We, you know, cribbed a thing that we, you could do in v1 beta 1 ingress where you were allowed to put a slash in the name of a secret, and so we said, okay, that means it's in a different namespace. Pretty hacky way to do this. Would have been much better to have a separate um, field, but yeah, this is what we ended up doing at the time. So but yeah, that, that's sort of the main thing here, is that it lives next to the, to the secret that's being delegated, and it grants access to it from, out, from other namespaces. So in Gateway API, we wanted to do this in a more uh, stable, we wanted to do this exact same thing, but in a more stable, structured way. Um, and so this is, this is our standard uh, diagram for Gateway API and how the resources break down. Um, one of the other things that we're trying to do in Gateway API is we're trying to make it so that we break down the resources by the persona that needs to use them. So a Gateway class is like roughly analogous to uh, Ingress class, but it's designed for the people who own the, the infrastructure, the people who set up controllers, who have full, you know, a large amount of access to a cluster, and then uh, individual cluster operators can create individual gateways which roughly correspond to a load balancer. Roughly, roughly. Not always, but a lot of the time. Um, and then application developers can create routes of different types. HTTP route is about terminated HTTP traffic. There's TLS route, TCP route, UDP route, a bunch of other stuff. Um, but the, the key part here is that we're sort of trying to break things down by a persona. Uh, and so when we're talking about these personas, it's pretty common that, say, the gateway and the, app and the HTTP route will be owned by different people because they're different personas. Uh, a lot of, sometimes maybe they won't, maybe they'll all be, all these personas will simultaneously exist in the same person, but the whole point of it is that we're designing it so that they don't have to. And so what we ended up doing is we ended up trying to find ways that we could solve this sort of problem. Where you've got um, a, shared, a shared gateway in a shared namespace, uh, and then you have HTTP routes living in the individual app namespaces that refer to that shared gateway. And so this is, a, this is, again, a classic, hey, we want to be able to do a cross namespace reference kind of problem, and we, but we want, you know, we want there to be this agreement between these two parties, between the owner of the gateway and the owner of the HTTP route. Um, <clears throat> so the way that we ended up doing that is because gateway is a new thing, uh, it's a new CID, and we have control of the entire spec, and we can change anything we like, um, the way that we did it was that we made it so that HTTP routes basically request, so you can see on the, on the uh, right-hand side here, um, the HTTP route has a parent ref section that specifies the name and the namespace of a gateway. Um, that's actually, <laughs> there's actually a few other fields in there that we're not using here. You can do other types of things other than gateway, but you know, the important part for this talk is that uh, you know, the shared gateway is in a different namespace to the uh, HTTP route. And so on the shared gateway then, you have this allowed route stanza that lets you say, hey, uh, only namespaces that uh, have the shared gateway access true label are allowed to, are allowed to have HTTP routes use this, uh, use this gateway. And so that's, that's again, this, this is the two-way handshake, right? Like you've got the HTTP route requesting to be able to use a gateway, and the gateway has to sort of accept. It's almost like, the allowed routes is almost like building a lock, and then the HTTP route, you know, may have the right key. 
Um, and so again, two-way handshakes, that's the order of the day here. But yeah, and this one was only possible because we control both sides, of the spec of both sides of these objects. So when we talk, start talking about, uh, yeah, hang on, I haven't missed anything there, good, good. Um, so when we start talking about core objects though, we can't change secret or service or you know, any of the other core Kubernetes objects there because they're, they're GA objects um, and you know, we don't get to make changes to them. So we, had, we needed to come up with a way that we could have owners of those objects be able to do this sort of, um, you know, this sort of granting of permissions. Uh, and so that's, that's what reference grant is. Reference grant is the same idea that we had with that prior art of uh, contours, the TLS certificate delegation, just you know, kicked up a notch um, you know, to make it a bit more generic. So here's a reference grant. Um, this reference grant uh, allow, sits in the uh, app namespace with the service. It, it allows uh, references from HTTP routes in the namespace prod to uh, anything that's a service in the app namespace. All right, you know, pretty like reasonably simple spec here. Um, but yeah, it's all just about creating that lock that sort of says I allow, I explicitly allow this access. And we're very careful here that there's no implied access here. If you create an empty spec, it means nothing. You have to actively opt in through every one of these fields. You have to put them in specifically. There is no sort of default behavior for a reference grant unless you specifically put things in. And so here's another one that's a uh, secret, similar idea. Um, you know, this one uh, in, in the Gateway API, only gateways are reference TLS config, so they're the only ones that need to be able to reference uh, secrets. And so this one allows references from the gateway in the prod namespace to secrets in the uh, secrets of here namespace. So yeah, same idea. Um, you know, it's just allowing those, of allowing those references uh, in. So yeah, so the, the, here's the design goals for a uh, reference grant. You know, for things that we, can't we couldn't change the spec of easily, uh, service and secret are the first ones, but basically you can use these for anything that you can't easily add fields to both sides of. Um, I'll mention a bit more later, but um, some of the folk from uh, SIG Storage have used this for um, uh, some new support in a uh, PVC controller um, to be able to do cross namespace references to PVs which I thought was pretty neat. Um, but yeah, and the other key things here is it's owned by the owner of the granted object and lives in the same namespace. We, yeah, sure. No, 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 so it's literally just the, the seek, so the question was um, what do I mean by the, the granted object? Does it make a copy of the secret? No, the, the original secret stays where it is. And then the controller that you implement this with needs to respect this behavior. It's one of the, you know, it's one of the problems that if you want your controller to support reference grant, you have to like watch reference grants from everywhere and you have to, you have to implement this behavior that says you don't allow cross namespace references unless there's a reference grant that allows it. So you're, you're assuming that the controller has, can read anything from any namespace? Yes, exactly, yeah. So, respecting... yeah, yeah, so yes, you do, well, you assuming that the controller can read, oh, I'm just repeating for the recording, yeah. Exactly, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, so, so it's, not, it's not that you're, I mean, we actually called this reference policy originally, but that was an even worse name, um, because we have, uh, in Gateway API, we have another thing called policy attachment that is completely different to this, so we wanted to not reuse the same word for two things, uh, which, you know, big naming no-no. But yeah, so I think the, the key parts here are that the, you know, the secret lives where it is, the controller that is implementing this whole behavior needs read access to, like, you know, everything that you want to grant access to everywhere. Um, again, this comes from the world of ingress where it's quite common for your ingress controller to have read access to secrets across the entire cluster. Uh, whether or not that's a good idea, that is historically how it's been. If you want to be able to do a very dynamic ingress controller where you have, um, you know, you can create an ingress or a HTTP proxy or a gateway or a route anywhere, then and you, you, practically there's no way around that. Like you can't, you can't get away from the fact you have to just grant a bare read access to all secrets. Um, and that's because although there are secrets have a type, you can't sub, you can't, you can't like uh, sub allocate the, the RBAC based on the type. Ideally, 
you would have our back that says only grant access to TLS secrets, but we don't have that. We've only got by by kind, not by resource technically, but you know, but not by subtype. Um, great question, thank you. Um, so yeah, so the because it, it, we really wanted to avoid the problem of having to have the thing that we were do, building to do cross namespace references have cross namespace references itself. Um, so that's why the, the reference grant lives in the same, has to live in alongside the thing that you're granting access to so that you don't have that chicken and egg problem. Um, the, it groups access, it grants access to things by a group uh, kind and namespace. Um, the idea here being that, you know, if right now it's, it default, the group and the kind default to the gateway API um, group and kind so that you have left config when you're doing gateway API ones. Um, but the, um, but yeah, it, and, and then of course it allows a namespace. Um, <coughs> uh, I use label selectors there for the, um, the reference grant does not currently allow label selectors though. So the, um, the HTTP route and gateway interaction does allow label selectors, but the reference grant one does not. That's because when you have um, the label selectors plus the reference grant plus all the other things you've got to watch, adding in label selectors for namespaces means you also have to watch namespaces, and then you have like a whole extra reconciliation loop in, in case of namespace label updates. And so this is just about making these a little bit easier to implement. Um, yeah, when I come to the KEP, there's a couple of changes that people have requested, and one, that is one of them. So, um, yeah, here's some other notes. Uh, I think I talked about this. Uh, the reference grant has to be fully reconciled. So you can't just say, hey, I saw a reference grant at startup, now things are good. You have to watch the reference grants, and if the reference grant is removed, that constitutes revocation of, that, of, the, of the granted access. And so if someone removes a reference grant that allows access to a TLS secret for a gateway, you have removed, effectively removed the TLS secret, and that gateway is now invalid because there's no TLS secret. And so the exact behavior here can depend on the, on the exact type of reference and what you're doing with it and a bunch of other stuff like that, but the key part here is that if you revoke the reference grant by deleting it or by changing it such that the thing that you were referencing doesn't, is no longer in scope, then you have to revoke the access. Um, <clears throat> And again, yeah, controllers are expected to be, able to be granted very broad read access and then self-limit based on the reference grant. Um, so yeah, I mean, that doesn't help in the case that you're worried about controller compromise. Uh, you know, like if you're worried about your ingress controller being compromised and then get, having a read access, to all, this does not help you. Um, you know, uh, I think that is definitely a problem that we all should think about solving, but this is not designed to solve that problem. Um, <clears throat> in notably, Right now, there is no way to grant access to all namespaces. Um, you, we talked about maybe using a special star name to say to mean all namespaces. Again, I'm kind of in favor of that because my, my experience with this has been a lot of the time people are like, I know what I'm doing, I wanna be insecure, and I'm like, that's fine, as long as you're very clearly opting into something that's a terrible idea, um, you know, in general, and so, <clears throat> Having to take definite action to do something like really insecure is sort of my design goals for an API. Um, sure, so next steps. Uh, in terms of next steps, um, yeah, as I said, it's already used in SIG storage for cross namespace data, so data sources for persistent volume claims. So you can, right now, uh, it's in alpha, uh, in the latest release of Kubernetes, but in a persistent volume claim, you can reference a snapshot of a persistent volume that's in another namespace using a reference grant object. Um, and so, you know, when the, the folks from storage were doing that, that work, they were sort of like, oh, it kind of sucks that we've got to import all the gateway API objects just to be able to get re reference grant. And we were like, we agree, that does kind of suck. So um, we were hoping to, we opened a KEP to uh, move reference grant to a new API group home. Um, and so, yeah, uh, the two, those two QR codes are the the blog post and the, uh, and the KEP itself. Um, that KEP, uh, as of like two days ago, has actually been merged uh, as provisional. However, um, one of the things that happened is uh, the, all the reviewers, which I was really surprised about, were like, oh no, we don't want this to be a CID. Uh, the SIG author reviewers were like, no, this should not be a CID, this should be an entry core resource. And I was like, uh, okay, that's surprising. Um, I thought everyone would be more in favor of this being a CID, but 
in order for it to be a core resource, it needs to be much more generic than it currently is. It currently makes a lot of assumptions about the fact that you're running, probably running something like an ingress controller and about what sorts of things you're talking about and what sorts of access you're granting, most importantly. You're, like, you're almost always granting read access, or read only access to something, but you know, the SIG auth reviewers raise the very reasonable question of what about if you want to do a cross namespace reference where you're kind of implicitly granting some sort of write access? You know, like, and, and, and you want to restrict that separately to the read access. So, you know, we're looking, it looks like probably we're going to need to add like some other stuff like verbs to sort of further slice the access that you're granting down um, and some other stuff like that. So, um, really interesting work. Um, the original, the initial KEP has merged as provisional. Uh, and so we're iterating on that KEP right now and looking at doing some of the stuff like I just mentioned. The, um, and yeah, yeah, I think that part in particular will be really interesting. I mean, I'd be really happy <laughs> if this ended up as a core resource in a future version of Kubernetes. Um, it'd be really great. I think that it would be really handy for people. Notably, nobody is suggesting that although this resource might be in core, it will not be reconciled in core. It'll be like ingress, where the, the type itself exists in the core spec, but in order to have, get any behavior out of it, you need to install a controller that will reconcile it for you. Right, so um, <clears throat> I think everyone is in agreement that, that it's gonna work very much like ingress in that respect. So you'll need to install like a reference grade compatible controller. And one of the other things that's really interesting about the design here is there probably will end up being multiple reference grant controllers in the, cl in the cluster. You know, some of them might be a gateway API one, some of them might be a, a storage one, there might be some other ones, and they're all gonna need to uh, have some way to interact. And also then, some, way, some standard way of feeding back whether or not your reference grant is in use. Um, that is probably one of our biggest areas of upcoming work is how do we make it clear to you, the user, that the reference grant that you have created is actually correctly configured and is being used correctly. You know, uh, or more importantly, if you want to go and delete this reference grant, how do you know if 100 people are using it or if nobody's using it, right? Like, that seems really important to me too. That, uh, yeah, you wouldn't want to delete the wrong reference grant and have every, like 100 people be like, oh my God, you know, my TLS site just went down because you deleted the, you effectively deleted the key pair, the TLS key pair, that would suck. Uh, so you know, having some feedback available to people that uh, lets that stuff um, be sorted out would be good. Um, so I have talked much faster than I anticipated. Um, so you guys are all gonna get heaps of time for questions. Um, but here's my takeaways. So cross namespace reference that's are hard, really hard. Um, it's really, really important to do them correctly, but it's really, really easy to get them wrong. And so one of the things I wanted to do with this talk was to sort of have a way that, you know, to sort of tell people like, hey, that key, the key thing here is just that agreement between the two parties. You know, <clears throat> making sure that you have the agreement between the two parties is the right thing to do here. <coughs> Sorry. Um, and then, so multiple patterns are definitely possible to do this, to do this sort of uh, crossing trust domain uh, relationship. You know, we've already got two, uh, you know, we've got two examples today, the gateway uh, HTTP route mapping and then reference grant itself. Um, so, <coughs> yeah, as I said, that was a lot faster than it was when I practiced. I think I'm talking much faster today. <laughs> so um, we have a lot of time for questions. Uh, really sorry about that, but please feel free to hit me up. Yeah. Well, so I would argue that the thing that you are using is gonna to have to read Kubernetes resources in order to be able to reconcile the reference grant objects. That makes it a controller, right? Like you are building a controller that is gonna, that is gonna maintain like some sort of custom reference to this API key secret. Um, you know, like, so you're, you, the thing that you will have to build to do that is gonna to have to be a controller. Like you're gonna to have to have some, something that watches um, for reference grants, knows about API key secrets, <clears throat> knows like which ones are relevant ones and you know and how you would grant them and then um, allows the al allows the thing that you want to be able to use that secret to use it um, you most of what we've done here is about if you have a um, if you have a kubernetes object that needs to reference another kubernetes object not like a service that needs to reference a kubernetes object 
in the case that you're talking about where, um, you know, where probably you'd want, you know, if it's an API key or something like that, usually you'd want to mount that into, into the pod as like a, as a volume, is usually the way that you would consume uh, an API key like that. Um, and so you, you might want to be, if you want to be able to have something like that, you, know, you can absolutely can do it using a reference grant, but you would need then a custom controller to sort of manage the, how do you get the secret to the right place. Probably if you're spending that effort, you'd almost be better off building a, like a, a um, CSI plugin to handle the secret, uh, to handle the secret. So you can build a secret store plugin that will, when, that will provide you a virtual file on disk that when you access it will reach out via some web call to somewhere and, and give, it, give the contents back in a standard way. Um, so there's a few ones that will talk to Vault or you know, uh, the, key, the various key management stores, of clouds and stuff like that, so you can effectively mount a secret straight from some other key store into your pod. Uh, and, and then every time the pod accesses it, it gets the current value. Um, so yeah, I, I think, I see what you're saying, um, but yeah, if you did build something that, that wanted to do that sort of cross namespace reference, you're building a controller. Like, you know, it's gonna have to reconcile the reference grants because again, if you delete the reference grant, the access needs to go away. You need to revoke it. Is that? Yeah. yeah. <clears throat> Feel free to argue with me. Like I'm not, not saying I'm the only one who's right here. Like, <clears throat> yo, uh, yeah. Yes, yes, exactly, yeah, and so that's to prevent exactly this sort of thing, because if the reference grant can live in a different namespace to the thing it's granting access to, then you're gonna need a reference grant for the reference grant, right? Like, that doesn't seem like a good idea for anybody. Like, so that's why it was much simpler to make it that, and also it helps with the, the, the notion of ownership, that um, if the, uh, you, <clears throat> that the person who owns the object should own the reference grant, you know, it should be the same person. It's actually one of the things that the, uh, came up in the KEP review was that um, <clears throat> the SIG author reviewers would like us to mandate some sort of RBAC check that if you're creating a reference grant that allows access to a secret, that you as the user ha have access to that secret. Um, so that one is actually a pretty interesting problem of Im actually implementing that check. Um, <clears throat> and so like, yeah, we'll need to do, the controller that implements it would need to do like subject access review for the person creating the thing as like a validating webhook or something. Um, so yeah, that's a pretty interesting design that uh, I'm looking forward to talking to other people more about. Yeah, so again, uh, cool, awesome, thanks. Yeah, so I think, that, so the question was, um, with the uh, bringing of reference grant into core, um, what's gonna happen with the allowed routes and stuff? I think we'll probably will keep that the same because um, uh, it allows sort of a really clear thing for people who don't necessarily need to go off and learn about reference grant, like it's a, it's a very clear relationship. <coughs> Sorry, too much talking. Um, I did? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, 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 totally, yeah. I mean, I practic practically I think that we'll, um, that we will end up, uh, sort of owning the, the definition anyway, even once it moves into core. Um, yeah, so um, yeah, like I said, I think that the, uh, that, um, the, the level of work that we've got to do uh, is like, yeah, super interesting. So yeah, does uh, anyone else have other, other questions? If not, like maybe I'll uh, pull up that cap and walk you through a couple of things because we've still got ages. Um, yeah? Okay, let me pull up that cap. <coughs> Uh, let me find the link. Conference Wi Fi, hope you can do this. Good. So, that is the PR. Okay, so here's the cap. Um, you know, most of what uh, is in there. Ah, thank you very much, mate. You're a legend. 
most of what is in there is what I sort of went over already. Um, you know, one of the things, uh, the phrases that, uh, that we did come up with that I do like. So, you know, as usual for a cap, you sort of go through like risk and mitigations and stuff, like no default implementation. As I mentioned, that's one of the things, you know, you'll need to provide your own implementation. Um, <clears throat> you know, I mean, it is a pretty big risk that allowing any cross namespace references sort of does weaken the idea that the namespace is your fundamental unit. I, I would argue that, you know, this is weakening in a very controlled, careful way, and that's what, that's the best that we can hope for. Um, but yeah, like the thing, so the reference grant object is half of a handshake. That's one of the most important things that, you know, I would like you to take away from this is, you know, you gotta have the handshake, and the thing that we're talking about here, it's only half. You know, the other half is that something has to make the reference, and there needs to be a way for that thing to make the reference. So, um, <clears throat> yeah, and so, the, um, and so you, you can see here that we've sort of uh, ended up needing to bring in the thing that you, know, you need to have uh, read, read access at least to the things that you're granting access to. Um, so yeah, part of implementing control for this will be doing a subject access review of the person who's created that object um, and making sure that that person has access to the thing they're granting access to. Um, yeah, this, this, last, this one is one that I was a bit sad about, um, in the Gateway API reference grant, we chose to use kind rather than resource. Um, so who here knows about the distinction between kind and resource? Okay, one person, yeah. Um, most of the time, you, this doesn't matter. Um, but a kind is um, a singular object, um, a singular name, uh, capitalized. It's what you see at the top of your most YAML files. But um, it does not uniquely identify an object, like a, an object type. Um, a resource is actually the portion of the, uh, like the rest you, uh, a, uh, URL that does uniquely identify uh, a resource type. So because this a API is gonna end up being very generic, we can't get away with using the sort of may not be unique kind, even though using it would be much easier for people to understand. Um, and so practically what it means is that instead of doing something like this, where you're gonna be like kind gateway, you will need to be resource, gateways. And so the resource is actually the one that you see in kubectl and stuff like that. If you, you know, if you tab complete and you get like gateways, in this, the case of this, it'll be gateways.gateway.networking.kubernetes.io is the name of the resource, fully qualified name. And so that's why we, we have to use the name that you can use for the fully qualified name. Um, <clears throat> unfortunately, um, you know, as, as Tim Hawkins said, like, it kind of sucks that we have to do this, but here we are, like, we can't change it now. Um, yeah, uh, we've got the revocation behavior that I mentioned. The, um, you know, yeah, deletion, deletion of a reference grant means that the grant is access, granted access is revoked. Um, so the, um, one other thing here is it's like, you need to remove any config generated, but it's kind of up to you exactly what that means, right? So for the storage, for the storage use case that we talked about before, um, they're actually saying, if the reference grant exists when you make the reference and the, the, the persistent volume is provisioned, that's okay, that's enough. If the reference grant is later revoked, you don't like lose access to the volume, because that would be pretty bad. Um, whereas in the case of Gateway API, it's kind of expected that if the TLS secret goes away, then you can't serve, you shouldn't be serving traffic out of that gateway anymore. So it's a, it's a slightly different thing because it's a slightly different usage. And so it's one of the things that's a bit tricky about writing this, is that um, you know we have to have wording like some actions that have been enabled you know, can't be undone, but, but no future action should be allowed, right? So, um, you know, it's one of the hardest things about writing this sort of standard. Um, so we had some examples here. Yeah, I would definitely recommend that if you are interested in this, have a look at this cap. Obviously, it's going to be important later. Um, we will keep you all posted as this sort of makes it into actual core. Um, I would imagine there will be blog posts uh, in the future. Um, as you can see, you end up needing to put quite a lot of Yo, know, text around these sort of things. Uh, writing API specs turns out uh, you, you need to be. I have a lot more sympathy, I would say, for the people who write RFCs than I did before I started writing uh, API specs. I used to read RFCs and was like, oh, how could you possibly write something so dry? And I'm like, that's because if it's not dry and boring, then it contains ambiguity. And that means that engineers will take great delight in telling you all the ways in which it contains ambiguity and will make your day living hell until you remove the ambiguity. So, um, <clears throat> Yeah, but what about, what about if you do this edge case? Oh yes, okay, we better cover that too. 
Um, so yeah, uh, I think the yeah the, the one of the other things that uh, one of the other things that people have had an objection to is the use of from and to as the names. Um, you know, I think as this is a more generic API than the original Gateway API one, it kind of makes a bit more sense to have like you know uh, something like subject from subject origin subject object like you know I, I was like you could use subject object that's technically correct but it also means that you need to grammatically explain to people the difference between a subject and an object um, you know and people are generally pretty bad at that one so yeah uh, we look like we're going to be having a good old bike shooting session about uh, about the names there but uh, yeah so um, I, I feel like I'm starting to be a bit boring so I will uh, sort of stop here that we're, one of the things, like I said, that we really need a lot of design work on and I would love to hear people's opinions on is how best to surface information about how this thing is being used. Um, the naive answer is, oh, have a status on the reference grant. The problem then is that if you have 10 controllers reconciling different types of reference grant, every single one of them is gonna need to write status to every reference grant to say whether or not they're using it. And so how do you coordinate everybody writing into the one sub-resource is really, really hard. Um, and, and adds, can, produces lots of fun race conditions and eventual consistency bullshit, um, you know, that basically makes it really hard. So, yeah, um, I'm really interested in, like, spending a lot of time thinking about that sort of stuff. But, yeah, oh, sorry, yeah, go. Exactly, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, so that you need to, so either you need to be like, hey, you are consuming reference grants in your resource, your resource needs to have something that says the reference grant has been consumed because you know um, what the thing is, but then the owner of the reference grant has no way of knowing what, what possible resources could be consuming it aside from what they have allowed, right? So, yeah, exactly, right, like, yeah, so I mean, there's, there's a real interesting design space problem there about like how do you communicate the intent back to the user? How do you do that without creating like massive fan out problems for the API server where like updating one object means you then need to go and update the status for like 100 other objects and things like that is a real risk in this sort of uh, design. So yeah, there's a bunch of interesting, really interesting sort of design work there uh, for this API. But I think that, you know, as you can see, like it has a lot of potential. Um, I think that making, being able to make this sort of cross name space more secure in like a standard way uh, could be really uh, game changing for lots of different use cases. So yeah, um, with that, uh, I've probably taken up enough of your time. Uh, but yeah, uh, if, if you have any other questions, feel free to grab me here. Um, catch me on uh, Kubernetes Slack at Young Nick um, or, or grab me anywhere around today. So thanks very much everyone for your time.